Hi, this is Ange Pompano, author of The Mystery's Diet of Death and When It's Time for Leaving. Kick back with me and listen to Anne Dark, Tracy Stormy, and Kathy Knight with their guest on The Dark and Stormy Podcast. Hello, and welcome to Dark and Stormy Book Club. Today, we have a wonderful interview with the author Greg Olson. Enjoy! I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club, a podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome! If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. American Mother, the true story of a troubled family, motherhood, and the cyanide murders that shook the world by Greg Olson comes out today from Grand Central Publishing at 5.02 on June 5th, 1986. An emergency call came into the local sheriff's office in the small town of Auburn, Washington. A distressed housewife, Stella Nickel, said that her husband, Bruce, was having a seizure. Officers rushed to the mobile home to find Stella standing frozen at the door. Bruce was on the floor. As Stella became the beneficiary of over $170,000 in a life insurance payout, Forensics discovered that Bruce had consumed painkillers laced with cyanide. A week later, 15-year-old Haley was getting ready for another school day. Her mom, Sue, moments later collapsed on the floor. Sue never regained consciousness, and the autopsy revealed that she had been poisoned by cyanide-tainted headache pills, just like Bruce. While a daughter grieved the sudden and devastating loss of her mother, a young woman, Cindy, was thinking about her own mom, Stella. She thought about the years of neglect and abuse, the tangled web of secrets Stella had shared with her, and Cindy contemplated turning her mom into the FBI. We would like to welcome to the program Greg Olson. He has a wonderful new book out called American Mother, The True Story of a Troubled Family, Motherhood, and the Cyanide Murders that Shook the World. Welcome, Greg. Hey, thank you, Anne, and hello to Tracy. Glad to be here with you both. We are a little older than some of our listeners, and we are very familiar with what your book is about. Could you give a little blurb of what this new book is about? Absolutely. It's the story of Stella Nickel, who was a woman out here in Washington State that decided that her life wasn't going the way it wanted to or where she wanted it to go. She had bigger dreams and not very much money. So she had this idea that, you know, I'm like everybody. She's, I'll kill my husband in order to get his insurance money. And we've heard that kind of story before. But what Stella did in this case was she tampered with Excedrin capsules by putting cyanide in them. She fed them to her husband, Bruce. He died. And she thought, well, okay, I'm going to get rich now. I'm going to get that money. But it didn't turn out that way. She didn't get the accidental death notification she'd hoped for. So she decided, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to put some of those poison pills out on the shelves in the Seattle area. And when she did that, a woman named Sue Snow, who was the mother of two girls, recently married, she decided every morning as she did to take a Excedrin. And it turned out that she had ingested cyanide and died, sparking outrage and a 
citywide, uh, nearly nationwide recall of all the Excedrin product that was out in the marketplace because we didn't know how many bottles were out there, but we knew that at least in Washington state, there were two deaths related to cyanide. Didn't Stella have a double indemnity insurance that if it was accidental death, she would get double the insurance paid out? That's right. And that's what really prompted her to put those other bottles on the shelves and that when they did the autopsy of her husband, they deemed his death due to emphysema, meaning just a regular death, natural causes. That wasn't what she wanted at all. She did want them to detect the cyanide so that she could get that double indemnity and also sue the drug manufacturers for not having safe products. What came first, these or was it the Tylenol? It was actually the Tylenol case that made her think about this sort of opportunity on what she could do to be, uh, you know, to kill her husband and then not be a suspect because those Tylenol killings that killed seven people had never been solved. And if you think about it, putting poison out in a bottle or somewhere, it's sort of a random kind of crime and the police really don't have much to go on. So that one was stalled. It was never really fully solved. And Stella thought, well, you know what? I could kill my husband in lots of different ways. And she talked about it with friends. She talked about hiring a hitman. She talked about running over him on the highway in her car. She had all these different ideas, but she settled on the cyanide in the capsules because of Tylenol and what had happened years before in Chicago. Oh, wow. I read your earlier book, Bitter Almonds. And I understand this is an update of that book? Yes. What made you decide to do an update? Well, the strange thing, when I wrote that book all those years ago, the idea was two things. Cindy Hamilton, who was Stella's daughter, she was the one who ended up testifying against her mother. The book is much about that. It's about her trying to put her mother in prison, and she ended up getting a huge reward from the drug manufacturers for helping convict her mom. And then she vanished. And really for like 25 years, no one could find her. I looked for her, I tried to find her. And then about two years ago, through email, I got a note from her. Actually, oh, wow. It was actually from Facebook. Now, when I think about it, she Facebooked me and I called her and talked to her. She had wanted photographs that were from her family and she knew I had them because I've had them for like 25 years in my garage. She wanted a particular baby picture and we started talking. That was really kind of like gave me the idea that maybe this is worth revisiting a bit because I'd finally spoken to that missing piece, which was the girl, now a, a woman in her 60s, who had turned against her mother. I watched several programs about this case and at least on one or two, there was suspicion cast on the daughter. Has that been alleviated? Well, here's the thing. We really don't know the truth about any of this. I mean, we know the story that the FBI gave. We know it was testified in court. And really, Anne and Tracy, you know that those are stories, right? Those are versions of the truth. They're what they need to do to get a conviction. So I don't know if Cindy was a part of it. I always suspected that she was. And yet when I finally talked to her on the phone, she said something to me that made me think she had a different code about the whole affair. And she said that I did not know, my, I loved my uncle Bruce or my stepfather Bruce, I loved him. And if my mom had just killed him and not brought in Sue Snow into the mix, I would have never gone to the police or the FBI. She said, but if she kept the murder in the family, it would have stayed in the family. So it made wow. me kind of think about Cindy, like that's kind of a big thing to say. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so I kind of feel like she probably wasn't part of it. Yeah, it doesn't sound Yeah, like it. and her saying that, I don't know how I could be okay with anybody being murdered, but she put it out there. So, wow. I, yeah. That could, they, uh, changes my mind too. <laughs> yeah. I interviewed Stella many times in prison, I think at least four times in person. I really pushed her along to try to indict Cindy in some way to say that, did you guys do it together or did she do it? And Stella never came out and said that. But one time though, toward the end, she kind of opened up and said, well, maybe she could have done it, 
But here's what's interesting about Stella. You know, she held on to her innocence all these years, 30 years, you know, in prison, in federal prison in California. And just recently, in the last year and a half, she went before the parole board, as she's done before, and she confessed. And she, she said, did. yes, she said, oh. I killed my husband. I don't know why he didn't beat me. He wasn't unkind to me. I can't answer that. And, but she never addressed Sue Snow. So she never said anything about that. That kind of shocked me that she would finally confess. And then a year later, after that, she applied for compassionate release because she's about 78 now and has health problems and she wanted to be released from prison. So she decided I'll appeal to the government, see if they'll let me out. And in her appeal, all she talked about was Stella and how she missed out on high school graduations with her kids or weddings and all this stuff. She never once said anything about Sue. And that always, that it's, I don't know what to make of that. Maybe you have an idea about that. I think Stella can't ever admit to the full truth. It's just, just not able to because all she sees is herself. Yeah. yeah she's very nice. She just wants to get out. That's it. <laughs> That's it. You would think if she had all those years to think of a good excuse saying that Bruce was not mean to her or anything, she could have said something better, like I, I got beat up all the time or whatever. Right. Well, you know, you said she told anybody who wanted to listen about hiring a hitman and stuff, but she even went and got books out in the library. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. Poisonous had, plants. And, <laughs> right. It was totally planned and she did research it. At the trial, she said, I got these poisonous plant books you know, out of the library because I was worried that my granddaughter might ingest some uh, toxic plant from our, oh, from our yard or whatever. <laughs> but then they said, well, go look in the encyclopedias and see if she was doing any research on cyanide. And of course, the FBI found her fingerprints all over that. So there's no way she can say I was researching cyanide to protect my granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> she was a piece of work. I well, you know. Just because they're criminals doesn't mean they're smart. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Most of the time, they're not very smart. I'll tell you what, Stella, is, in a lot of ways, she's a likable kind of person, like a character when you meet her, if you saw her. I know she's an old lady now. When I saw her, she was still like 50 and she had the long hair and she had the tough swagger. Even though she's from Washington, she had, I don't know, like a Southern kind of feel to the way she talked and did stuff. I think she was a character. She was somebody like, if you knew her, like if you lived in her trailer park, God forbid, you'd all know her. You know, everybody would have a story, a Stella story about something that she'd done, whether it was something rotten or something good. I mean, she just stood out. Yeah. Her appearances on the documentaries, the little bits they showed of her, she looked like she was... A character. A character. <laughs> yes. yes, definitely. Has Cindy seen her mother? No. In fact, she has no plans to and never has and never will. And she says her mom's where she needs to be. So Probably Cindy. True. Yeah. She, Cindy has really no compassion for her mother. Her mother has done this to herself. Yes. And Cindy, was she an only child? She had a sister, Leah, and Leah, during my time when I finally had connected with Cindy, Leah had died. I don't know what happened to her exactly, but she was found dead, and I think she was 52 or 56, That's so nice. she's gone. Did that Cindy family. have a relationship with her sister? She did. She had a relationship with her sister. Kind of an update, because people will read the book, I hope is that Cindy and her birth father and uh, her half sibling have recently met for the first time. That's wonderful. Good yeah. for her. Actually, like yesterday, she sent me pictures of their reunion and whatever I felt about Cindy all these years, whether she was guilty or a part of it or whatever, I can only be happy now that at least, you know, whatever's happened, it looks like a better ending for her now. Yeah, and the way I look at it is, even if she did have something to do with it, she wouldn't have been put in that position if it weren't for her mother. It's not like she was going to come up with this on her own. That's exactly right. It is Stella's doing. Stella is one of those moms, you know, she used to beat her kids. She had to go to jail for child abuse. She wrote bad, bad checks. She worked as a prostitute. I mean, she did all sorts of horrible things. Cindy had to live with all that as a kid. I have a sympathy for her now. Before, you know, when I hadn't met her, 
really Anna and Tracy, I felt like I might be even a little bit scared of her because she seems like the way everybody talked about her, like she was so tough. Yeah, that's what they how they portray her. In yeah. Some of the yeah, all these friends, gosh. you know, like the, she'd knock you down or blah, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I kind of think, you know what? Maybe that's a, a facade. Maybe that's something that she used to get through a tough life. She sure Absolutely. had one. Wow. I was all this time thinking that well, maybe Cynthia had something to do with it. <laughs> I have a question. I watched sure. the Sally Jesse Raphael, rewatched it the other day to bring back some memories. And you were on there with her sister, I believe. Yes. Who was perfect. very adamant that she was innocent because she was a oh, nice yeah. person and she mm. wouldn't do such a thing. Did she ever change her mind? Well, see, I don't know if she did or not because Stella, remember, she stuck to her story until a year ago. So maybe she you know, waited until her sister passed. I think that could be possible. I mean, I wondered about that too. I wondered about like, all of those people, in fact, I Googled a bunch of them after I, you know, had heard that she confessed to see who was alive. So many of them are gone now. They were hard living folk. So I'm not surprised. And it's been a lot of time, but I kind of wonder also really, what would they say now if they had known that their friend who they stuck up for or their sister had finally admitted the truth? It would be a blow. Yes, I imagine it would be. Now, Greg, is this book currently out? No, it comes out today. Yes, it comes out today, which I'm real excited about. Yeah, yeah. by Grand Central Publishing. For our listeners who are not familiar with this story, please check this out because you will not be disappointed. For those who one. even know about it, this is a deep dive. What are you working on? Funny thing is, I don't know if you have read my book years ago. It was my very, very first book called Abandoned Prayers. It was about- Oh my goodness, yes, book. yes. That was my first book. You know, that book's still in print after all these years, which is very unusual. It's a real kind of a mystery as to what happened to that little boy and what Eli Stutzman, the father had done, starting with his wife's death. And I'm investigating now because a family member from the Amish contacted me recently and said, I really feel like Ida, that was her name, didn't get justice. So I'm digging into that. And that is a book I'm going to deliver to my publisher at the end of this month. And it's called The Amish Wife. And I'll tell you what, I've solved the crime. You have. Oh, oh my goodness. I can't right. wait well, to read this. When that comes out, get in touch and we'll have you back on because I remember that book so well. What year was that? It came out, believe it or not, 1990. Oh my goodness, that was just a, a young thing, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, me and you both. <laughs> I won't I mean, say the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, look for that, and I'd love to come back on and talk to you both about that, and I'll make sure my publisher gets you an advanced copy, too. Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. Well, Greg, this has been such a pleasure. You have been on our list to have on the show because fans of our show love true crime. So you fit the niche. Thank we you. wanted to have you on when you wrote the one about the other mother of the oh. air up in <laughs> Washington. Oh. Is Washington yeah. State a hotbed? <laughs> it really is. But, hey, let me tell you one thing, a postscript. If your listeners have ever read or listened to the story about Shelly Notek, if you tell, here's a news flash for y'all is that she is getting out and she'll be released, I believe, before this thing airs oh, no. uh, to an assisted living location somewhere in Seattle. And I never thought I'd see the day she'd be released, but here oh, she is. Oh, I can't believe they're writing her out. <laughs> She's the worst one ever. Yeah, she okay. even makes Stella look like she, look, she makes Stella look like Haley Mills or somebody. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. All right. All Thank right. Thank you so Greg. much. Thank All you. Right. All right. Take care, Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. When we did this interview, I hadn't finished the book, but I am telling you, Greg Olson knows how to tell a story, and we thank him so much for taking time to talk with us. Trivia! Last week's question was, Alfred Hitchcock adapted one of his movies from a famous mystery. 
Which one and who is the author? A. Rear Window by Josephine Tay. B. Vertigo by Ruth Rendell. C. The Birds by Daphne du Maurier. Or D. Gaslight by Agatha Christie. The answer is C. The Birds. The Birds was a short story written by Daphne du Maurier. It was republished in 1963 in a book called The Birds and Other Short Stories. This week's question is, which author quit writing temporarily and became a full-time advertisement copywriter for a jewelry company? A. Dashiell Hammett B. James Patterson C. Walter Mosley or D. G. K. Chesterton Tune in next week for the answer. Well, that concludes a wonderful episode of Dark and Stormy Book Club. This book, American Mother, is on our very recommended list for true crime lovers. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you will join us next week. And remember, life would be boring without a little mystery. Bye.